wanted to know if the mythology in Disney's Hercules is actually that accurate. Well, look no further because I'm going to be giving a detailed breakdown of the movie and what is historical fiction and what is historical fact. I'm just going to apologise now for how I look and sound. You may notice my voice is a little bit different. Uh, I am not very well. I think potentially have COVID but I don't have any tests so I'm just being cautious and isolating. But yeah, don't sound that nice. So I'm very sorry to your ears for having to experience this. But anyway, welcome back to my channel. As you know, I spent a lot of time over the past couple of weeks talking about the real Egyptology behind Moon Knight, but now we're going to be looking at Ancient Greece with Disney's Hercules. If you don't recognise me and you're new here, hi, I'm Kelsey, I'm the creator of Bite Size Ancient History and a recent graduate of Cambridge University. I studied classics at undergraduate level and then Egyptology at master's level. So I like to think I kind of know what I'm talking about. If Moon Knight, Hercules and other fun historical films sounds like the kind of content you might be interested in, don't forget to like this video and subscribe so that you don't miss out on future videos. Generally, if you're interested in learning more about the ancient world and just listening to some fun historical facts, don't forget to check out my other socials. Without further ado, let's get into it, because there is a lot to say about this film, unsurprisingly, because the whole narrative is based on Greek mythology, so almost every two minutes there is something to say about whether it's right or wrong. The movie starts by giving us a summary of basically everything that has happened in Greek mythology up to this point that has got us here regarding the Greek gods. But of course, because it's Disney, we do this in a fun way, so we have the muses sing it to us, and absolute banger. So the movie describes the muses as the goddesses of literature, science and art and this is a pretty good summary of what the muses in ancient Greece were. And I like that they've chosen for the muses to give us this summary because in Greek literature, for example, works like the Iliad, where it would have been performed orally, they would actually evoke the muses to tell this narrative. They were the ones that you would go to to kind of recite what has happened. So in the movie, we have five muses, and that's when it's a little bit less accurate. The Greek muses actually originated in an area called Boeotia, and when we find them in this area, there's actually just three of them. However, other regions, as time progresses, actually develop nine. So it's kind of like a nice middle ground, I imagine, and nine people is a lot to keep track of, and perhaps three isn't enough to tell this Mahusid story. The Muses were originally the daughters of Zeus and Nemesine, which is the goddess of memory, and I apologise if you're pronouncing that any differently to myself. Cut me some slack. And if you've noticed, I've said Daughters of Zeus there, and we know in the film he's married to Hera, so that is a whole nother can of worms that we're going to get onto later when it comes to Zeus and his love life. So, which muses do we actually have in this film? We have Calliope. She is the one that wears a headband and has quite curly hair, and she is the goddess of epic tales, i.e. she's the one that gets evoked within stories like the Iliad, and it makes sense that we use her here because she's about to tell us this epic tale of the story of the gods. Then we have Cleo, the goddess of history, who has her hair in a ponytail. Again, it makes sense because she's telling us the history of the gods. We then have Mel Pomini, and this is the goddess with long hair, and she actually represents the goddess of tragedy, so Greek tragedy, Greek plays. And again, it makes sense because the narrative isn't necessarily always a positive one, there's a lot of angst behind it. And then we have Terpsichore, and she's the one with a slightly shorter haircut that kind of has waves or kinks within it. And she is the muse of dance, which naturally makes sense in a Disney kind of musical. Finally, we have Thalia, who is the slightly shorter goddess, and she is the goddess of comedy. And it makes sense with exactly the way they portray her, she is the funny friend in the group and you kind of need something to lighten it up because this is a Disney kids film. So while they may not have included all of the muses, their selection makes sense each time. So kind of fair points. Let's talk about who they are missing. Euterpe, the goddess of flutes and music. Flutes is a little bit obscure so it makes sense that we miss her out. We already have the goddess of dance. We don't know. We do need music but I see where they missed her out. Irato, the goddess of love poetry, again, 
Mm, it's a PG kids film. Polyhymnia, the goddess of sacred poetry, and Urania, the goddess of astronomy. So again, yeah, they don't really fit in. Their choice makes sense. Finally, they start to tell us the origin story of the current Olympian gods. And I like the little detail when they talk about tragedy that they use a Greek mask because these were very real. So how accurate is this story that they tell us? They are correct in the fact that the Titans were the rulers before the current Olympian gods, i.e. Zeus, Hera, Athena. Hesiod tells us that they are the 12 children of Uranus and Gaia. In this group of 12, we have Oceanus, Coeus, Creus, Hyperion, Lapetus, Cronus, Theia, Rhea, Temis, Nemosyne, Phoebe, and Tethys. Cronus is the most important one here, as he is the one that seizes power from Uranus and overthrows him. And this is when we have the era of the Titans. In a very Greek mythology way, he has children with his sister, Rhea. However, it's prophesied that one of these children will overthrow him. So to prevent this in the same way that he overthrew his father by his mother conspiring against him, he eats the children, but doesn't digest them. That's the key part. Kind of upset by the fact that her husband is eating her children, Rhea goes to her parents and, and asks for their help, to basically help hide one of the children. And the child that she ends up hiding is Zeus. So instead of giving the baby Zeus to Cronus, she actually gives him a bag of rocks. And this is what he eats while Zeus is happy, hiding away in a cave, waiting to grow up and get strong so that he can overthrow his father. He successfully does so and is able to bring back all of his siblings because they hadn't been digested. After this, he confines the Titans to Tartarus, the underworld. So their description of this, bang on. They also mention that the Greek gods live on Mount Olympus. And again, this is absolutely accurate. This is what Greek mythology tells us. Mount Olympus is said to be the highest mountain in Greece. However, there's a lot of debate around which mountain it might be. The fact that they show clouds surrounding Mount Olympus is pretty accurate to some extent. So Homer describes the fact that there was this cloud-like ether surrounding Olympus. However, it stopped before the actual peak of the mountain where the gods would live. They kind of lived in this clear sky environment, whereas the film shows them very much living amongst the clouds. With this established, we meet Zeus and Hera on the day where they're celebrating the birth of Hercules. As I said before, Zeus is a questionable character and Disney does not pick up on this. Hercules is not the child of Zeus and Hera. But before I get into that, who are Zeus and Hera? Zeus we've established is the king of the Greek gods having overthrown Cronus. And then Hera is one of his sisters, which he saved from the father. And yeah, he married a sister again. Um, she is also the goddess of marriage and childbirth and love. However, they are not a happy couple. Greek mythology will often show them fighting and mainly because Zeus has multiple affairs, like in the hundreds. And not just normal affairs, he'll disguise himself as animals and different people in order to execute these affairs. So this is an example of one of those. Hercules' actual mother is Alcimene, and Zeus disguises himself as her husband. Yeah, it's not great, and Hera is not happy. However, she decides to take this out on Hercules and his twin brother. What the film doesn't show is that Hercules has a twin brother called Iphicles. And in order to exact her revenge, Hera tries to delay the birth indefinitely. Fortunately, other gods have come to the rescue and Alcimene eventually gives birth to these twins. Alcimene quite rightly fears Hera and goes to the gods for help. So Athena takes Hercules and actually presents him to Hera without telling her who it is. So Hera actually ends up nursing him and looking after him pretty well because she doesn't realize it's the, ki the kid that she basically just tried to kill. However, he's not very good at being nursed, so the quote is that he suckled so strongly that it kind of hurt her and he, she threw him away and the milk is what creates the Milky Way. 
But the key thing is that having suckled from the Greek goddess, he now has acquired some supernatural or godlike powers, which we do see in the film, despite the rest of what I've just said being inaccurate. Athena eventually returns him to his mortal parents, who continue to raise him for the rest of his life. And the parents that we see are the parents that we see in the film. Interestingly, he originally has the name Alcides and then is only later called Heracles in order to kind of pacify Hera. If we break it down, Hera, Hera, and then Cles or Cleos in the Greek means glory, so it's kind of like glory to Hera. Aside from this, back at the celebration we see other gods. One of them that we see is Hermes, and they pretty accurately depict him. We see him wearing the Talaria winged sandals, we see him with his special star, and in later Greek mythology and depictions he is shown as having wings on his hat as they also show here. He makes a really funny joke about the fact that there's more love in this room than Narcissus with the lake and this is a really good reference to the mythology of Narcissus who basically falls in love with his own reflection, hence we get the term narcissism. Hercules as a gift is given Pegasus. What is Pegasus? Pegasus is a divine winged horse and he is mentioned in Greek mythology. Like the film shows him, he's described as being pure white. However, whilst he exists, he wouldn't have known Hercules. They never worked together, they were never companions. However, he did serve another Greek hero called Bellerophon. And in this, he helped him battle other Greek mythological creatures like the Chimera. So they just kind of stretched which hero he served or was a companion to. Then eventually Hades crashes these celebrations. And it's worth noting here that obviously we've described the circumstances of Hercules, but there was no celebration on Olympus to crash. And Hades didn't hate Hercules, which kind of nullifies the rest of the plot of the film almost, because if anything, he treated Hades very well. He actually helped him out on a lot of occasions. For example, Cerberus, Hades' pet three-headed dog that we see later on, he lent him to Hercules. He even allowed Hercules to bring somebody back from the dead. So yeah, not any hatred at all. And generally, Hades wasn't a bad guy. The process in which he actually started to rule the underworld was a random allotment which Zeus and Poseidon probably rigged. So Zeus, Poseidon and Hades are all brothers and they had to decide who would have control over different parts of the world. So Zeus got the sky and the land, whereas Poseidon got the sea and then Hades was left choosing last and got the underworld. While there may have been some initial feelings of resentment, he was generally good at the job and didn't hate it. Hades then goes to the fates to try and know what's going to happen with Hercules and how he can overthrow the Olympian gods. The fates, or Mori, were again very real in Greek mythology. They were the incarnations of destiny. And as they show, there were three of them. So there was Clotho, the spinner, she was in charge with the moment you were born. There was Lachesis, who was in charge of the events throughout your life. And then Atrox, which was in charge of your death. And this is where we see them cutting the thread. However, they borrow some traits over from the Grey Eye, who are described as sharing one eye and one tooth. So we see the fates in Hercules as lacking these things. So. But this seems to be a common misconception in Greek mythology films. In this, they try and tell the fate or the prospective fate of Hades in overthrowing Zeus. And unfortunately, Hades never tried to do this and he never tried to release the Titans as they show. However, Poseidon did at different points in Greek mythology. So it's interesting that they've chosen to do Hades instead. Pain and Panic, the evil henchmen of Hades, kidnap Hercules and try and give him a potion which is going to take away his godlike powers and just make him mortal. And they bring him down to earth. Pain and Panic were the children of Ares. They were never henchmen of Hades and this potion never existed. As we said, the parents and their names are accurate, but the fact that we show them living in this small little farmhouse is not. They were actually a very noble family. So, kind of 50-50 accurate. 
Um, I think that's where I'm going to leave this first part. So don't forget to like this video and subscribe so that you don't miss out on part two, and I'll see you next week. Bye!